How's it going? Good. How are you, mate? Good. Thank you. Are you in the car? I am. Yes. <laughs> and it's like um, it's five o'clock in the morning here, so the sun's not even up, but it will be soon. So oh, I will my. have more light. In here. Wow. I'm a shame. I mean, <laughs> when you said five, I was like, you sure you want to do it at five? <laughs> oh, classic. What time is it for you? It's not bad. It's like seven p.m. for me. So I was like, oh, yeah. I mean. I could have easily gone a bit later, but I was like, okay, maybe you want, maybe that's the best time for you. <laughs> well, the kids, it's before the kids get up is, is easier. Yeah. So, and I've, I've been getting up at 4am and going down to the beach and doing yeah. my meditation and stuff before they get up. Yeah. So, hey, hey, Craig. Hey. How's it going tomorrow? How are you? Good. How are you? Brilliant. Thanks. Nice and early. Wow. Yeah. It's still dark here, but it will, <laughs> it will actually get light soon. <laughs> nice. Good job. She, uh, how dedicated is Coxie? She's in the car, but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, uh, it's a first day. I was, super impressed. I was like, wow. Yeah. It's so funny. I know I won't be interrupted by the kids. Like yeah. they can't get in here. They can't oh, get beauty. in. Beauty. That yeah, is dedication. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, it is for sure. <laughs> how do you two know each other? So we, oh. we actually met in Ibiza, almost similar to like yourself. I know we met in London, but like Craig and I met yeah. in Ibiza. But, um, <laughs> what a place. As you do. Like, like on the dance floor? Or? Yes. Woo. Uh, almost <laughs> like, oh, well, I, I had like rocked up to um, just go there to see a, a mutual friend of ours. And I hadn't booked any accommodation or anything. And um, I just went to the apartment. I arrived at like eight in the evening. And I was like, hey, how's it going, guys? <laughs> I'd never met any of them. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. We were literally getting ready to go. Like, we were about yeah. to leave. And this guy rocks up. And we're like, hey, what's up? Let's go party. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Coxie, have you done a podcast before? No, I haven't, actually. Awesome. This is, I've awesome. listened to many, but yeah. this is the first one. Uh, and I'm cool. just wondering, like, where my T-shirt is, too. Like, <laughs> Craig, didn't you send it? Yeah, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's must... weird. It should have arrived. Anyway, you know the post. <laughs> oh, classic. No, I actually think the audio might be epic in the car compared to... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got my sound studio here. Yeah, this is great. Like, I'm like super excited to hear how this one is actually. So... <laughs> Okay, doke. Cool stuff. Well, let's kick off. Uh, Damara Ryder, thanks so much for joining us here on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Um, I think that's the first time I've probably ever called you Damara. So, <laughs> yeah, it sounds weird. Uh, yeah, you're not in trouble. Don't worry, I swear. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're just really, really excited to have you on the podcast. So, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's so good to see you after yeah. so long. Yeah, you too. You too. It's uh, so nice to see your smiley face and, and your full of energy face. And I uh, just love chatting with you. Um, so I'll just uh, sort of pre-frame it that I might uh, call you Coxie uh, at some points in the in the podcast. Uh, I hope you don't mind that. Uh, and just for the people that are listening, um, Coxie is uh, is Damara's nickname from her maiden name, which is Cox, C-O-X. And um, yep, so Aussies love a nickname. And if you don't have one, I think uh, you're not Australian, hey? <laughs> uh, so, so uh, Coxie, you've, um, you've traveled the world and you've been uh, really, really successful um, throughout your life. But actually, things started off uh, in a real small town in Australia called Lockhart. Um, maybe you can just sort of take us back to, to those days of growing up in a town of 1,000 people. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I have amazing memories about growing up in the country and just felt like freedom. So we would just ride our bikes anywhere and everywhere and just sort of back in those days, there wasn't really any concerns about safety or anything like that. So it just felt really free. We, we lived in a beautiful community. Um, yeah, my dad was a mechanic. Uh, my mum was a stenographer, and yeah, just had a pretty good upbringing. Really, lots of friends. We we ended up moving away. My parents, you know, being such a small town, we moved away to Canberra when I was in high school, just to give us sort of better education opportunities and things like that. Um, but still, very closely connected to to that community. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I always think those kind of upbringings must be pretty amazing, you know, just that freedom, riding your bikes everywhere and 
mates and, and also all, you probably knew all the family friends and, and parents and what have you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think like I got to a, an age where I really wanted to go and explore the city and, you know, get in amongst it and that sort of thing. But it's one of the reasons why I think I'm back in a sort of small community type area. Now, once I had kids, I was like straight back to the country because <laughs> I wanted them to have a similar experience of freedom and not, you know, just not sitting in traffic for oh. the hours a day and, and things yeah, like that. Like sure. you can actually just breathe, you know, wow. yeah, we're in a beautiful, yeah. definitely have been a beautiful part of the world at the moment uh, in Noosa in Australia. So I'm, I'm sure that's up your alley a hundred percent. So you mentioned that uh, your, your dad was a mechanic and your mum was a, a stenographer Obviously, um, we had to uh, have looked that up quickly because we were like, <laughs> <"What's that? laughs> and, um, but she um, actually worked for three prime ministers of Australia, which is really interesting. And um, did your folks have like quite an influence on you growing up? Yeah, absolutely. They did. Um, uh, my family, uh, the whole family of just hard workers, you know, um, really just striving to be the best that they can be. And um, yeah, they really did. They were really great role models and both were involved in the community in, in Lockhart. Um, my dad was a member of Apex and he was a volunteer firefighter and, and yeah, mum was involved in anything and everything. She's got like super high energy and, um, he's really sporty and yeah, so they definitely had an influence as well as my, um, broader family as well. I've got a cousin who, um, is a, is a lawyer she has her own family law firm in Sydney and another cousin who runs a business and yeah, they're all sort of business, um, highly driven people. So wow. definitely yeah. had an influence. Yeah. And if you know who you are now and everything that constitutes you, you've obviously taken like little bits of all those people and, and, uh, yeah, I guess used it to sort of mold, uh, who you are right now. So you mentioned that you, uh, moved to Canberra, um, and, uh, you obviously, have always also liked Aussie rules. You've loved Aussie rules and uh, you met uh, your Joshi, who is your husband um, when you were in high school. And I guess that's good that you liked Aussie rules because I'm, I'm sure that he played it. Uh, so what can you tell us yeah. about that? Was it like love at first sight when you, when you met him? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we met in high school, actually. It was definitely friendship at first sight. We were really good mates in, in high school and um, we both had, you know, different partners at, at that stage, but we had maths and science classes together and he was just a real larrikin. And um, like I remember him and his mate Muzza, who you've met as well, they would like do things like staple each other in the arm in maths <laughs> class. Just like, I don't know why, but they were hilarious. And anyway, yeah. So we sort of developed a good friendship there and, and we got together in um, year 11. So <clears throat> we were both about 17 when we got wow. together, so it's been a long time. Yeah, like, oh, what's that? It's 25, 25 years, yeah. Yeah, that's wow. so cool. That's so cool. I mean, uh, high school sweethearts, and then he's such a legend bloke. I mean, actually, Craig, <laughs> Craig and I were speaking about it, and he was like, oh, tell me about, you know, how you guys know each other. And then I obviously spoke a lot about you and a lot about Joshi. So you uh, guys make a power couple, that's for sure. Yeah, he's awesome. He's just a big kid and he hasn't changed. Exactly. <laughs> it's pretty amazing to me always when people have met at high school and like are still together. I think it's pretty cool because I guess you grow, you're, you're, you know, you really grow together, I guess sometimes apart. It happens too, but in your case together and you, your whole lives are like fully entwined. It, it's quite a, um, a long time to, or in a sort of a vulnerable age to, to be together and then stay together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, it hasn't always been easy, but we like, we had a really great relationship from the start in that, like, we always just wanted each other to experience the most out of life and sort of not that, you know, that sometime in, in early relationships, you wanting to put restrictions and limitations on each other. And we didn't do that. And both of us, um, traveled independently overseas with our friends and, um, and none of that was ever a problem. We had probably about a year that we were apart, um, uh, over that time, but yeah, just came back together. And I would say that I'm a very different person to what I was back then and, mm. and, and him too, probably me more so um, <laughs> in terms of just like growing into spirituality and just interests that I probably didn't have back then. And 
yeah, but it's just always worked. And yeah, now we have two beautiful kids together. So oh, it's no, been awesome. Amazing. Wow. And, and you <laughs> mentioned very that... lucky because we have like all similar friendship groups as well. You know, like there's all those connections too. So yeah, I'm a lucky yeah. girl. <laughs> that's, really, that's really amazing. You, you mentioned um, mates and stuff, but you also had said that you had a bit of a story about uh, our, our mutual mate Gareth over here, and I, and I kind of <laughs> a little bit piqued my interest a little bit. So, what, what was when did you guys see each other last? Oh, uh, in Hong Kong, actually. So I, um, when I was working for Macquarie Bank, <laughs> am I allowed to say this, Gareth? Of course you are. Go ahead. I can do like I, the, am, eh? I can do the G-rated version if you want. No, go. I want the. <laughs> you know which one I want. <laughs> you can't let Greg um, down, now, I so. oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um when I was living and working in Hong Kong and, and Gareth came and visited us and we met through a, a mutual friend of ours, Mickey. And um, yeah, we just really hit it off. We sort of traveled actually in London and Ibiza together previously. And we last saw each other in about 2008, I think it was in Hong Kong. And we went out for a bit of a night out and it was amazing. <laughs> and he's just the, the funniest person to go out with. I'm sure you know. And I can't quite remember whether we, we all three of us, me and Josh and um, Gareth came home together or whether the boys came home later, but I just remember like, coming <laughs> out because something like the music was really loud and something was going on. So I came out and, there's Gareth standing there vacuuming my apartment, either naked or in his undies. I can't. I don't think you have any clothes on. I can't remember. I think I was naked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so oh random. God. Like oh, that is super <laughs> random. What a classic. I know. I, I I thought I thought it was. I mean, now that you say that, I remember that. But I also thought I was outside, like your your house, like apartment trying to get in and i was weeing in the dustbin outside that, that could be a completely <laughs> different story but um, it was another night out <laughs> yeah it might have been the second night we went out i just to... remember we were just in fits of laughter most of the time we just we yeah we, yeah. we had to have a good time for sure oh, it's so good to laugh with good mates hey wow <laughs> but um taking it back to to your family uh Damara, your uh, it's quite sad, but your dad had um, uh, a disease which was obviously later diagnosed as Huntington's, which is devastating. Um, but before that, there were often times where there was very little communication, and and you actually mentioned that it resulted in a little bit of anger and frustration uh, for you. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, well, sort of growing up, it was hard to understand and it was sort of many years before we figured out what was going on for him um he was just constantly in a lot of physical and and mental pain i guess is the best way to describe it and so um looking back now i can see how you know i can have compassion for how difficult it must have been for him because yeah he just didn't really have the ability to express a lot of what he was going through so it it, it sort of came out in um, just frustration and anger and, and, and pushing us away a lot. And, um, you know, just, I just remember having to walk on eggshells a lot and you just wouldn't know what you, what you were going to get with him. Um, yeah. And it's a really cruel disease actually. It's something where, um, parts of your brain cells just start to die off really, really slowly. So he, he he spent 15 years in an aged care facility <laughs> which is um just horrendous and he was first uh he first went in there at the age of i think of about 55 or, or maybe it was 50 or something like, that, like really young like all of the wow. other people in in that facility were in their 80s and 90s and most wow. of them had dementia um Oh. And Huntington's disease affects people differently, but with dad, it was mostly physical. Like he was, he was sharp as a tack and he, even though he couldn't talk for the last couple of years of his life, he was still all there. So oh, I don't know man. if that's worse because he was actually that's aware so of, surround, of his surroundings and stuff, but it's, 
was just a horrendous, horrendous disease. So yeah, and he he struggled so much with with just even accepting that he had it. Like he was in denial for hmm. for many many years, which sort of made it hard off to care for him because he he refused. You know, he's very dependent, proud man, and um, refused a lot of help in the early days. Um, I remember coming home one day and I don't we still actually don't know what happened but there was like the whole glass sliding door was completely smashed down and there was blood like all over the walls and all over the carpet and he'd managed to get himself um, in an ambulance and and I think that that was sort of the turning point in sort of going okay dad no like we need to do something here and mm. and get you some help and get you some care and um yeah and uh, I sort of um I became his power of attorney and sort of had to, um, you know, be the, the strong person. So I guess it was a role that no daughter really wants to take on, but mm. it felt like a lot of responsibility at the time. But um, yeah, that's what we did. I, I so, you know, it wasn't like he, he didn't obviously didn't really want to go into care either. We looked at all lots of different options and yeah, was, I'm just sort of feeling my heart breaking again, just thinking mm. about, you know, like feeling like it was the best thing for him at the time, but also feeling like I was um, turning my back on him in, in his time of greatest need in, in getting him to do something that he really didn't want to do. Um, so, yeah. Sure. That's, uh, that's devastatingly difficult decisions to make. I mean, mm. good Lord. I mean, I, 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 yes, I can't even imagine it. Yeah. Yeah. Must, must, I mean, seeing, I, like seeing that blood when you came home from university, that must have been quite terrifying. And then I guess the whole like, process afterwards was, you know, and looking after your dad and uh, must have been rather traumatic. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like, it's weird because like at the time when I think when you're in that kind of traumatic situation, you, something kicks in and you just, you just get on with it and you deal with it and you do what you have to do to survive. I guess you just kick into that survival mode and it hasn't been until years later, like probably, you know, the last sort of five, five to, or more years for me that that trauma has caught up to me mm. and like, I'm like, oh, actually, no, that was significant. Like, you know, where I used to always, there was a point in time where it did start to affect me mentally. And I'd think about, you know, other people in the world and their situations being a bazillion times worse than mine. Like I had, I've had an amazing life. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that sort of idea, I was just sort of pushing it all down going, no, you know, like I'm fine. Um, but in actual fact that you know the reality was that the trauma has impacted me and my body and my health and my family and um there was a point in time where i had to accept that as well to mm. in order to start sort of the healing process but but yeah it was it was a horrendous time for him and he he is one of the strongest people that i have ever met to have endured such um pain and suffering for such a long time like decades yeah geez. and i never really understood it and there was a lot of years where i was really angry with him and i you know i judged him in so many ways for not being able to talk to us because you don't understand as a young person like mm. you know you take it all on and um and think it's you know that is there something wrong with me or dad doesn't love me or you know, dad's so, um, so hard on us and he's mm. heartless and all that kind of stuff. You don't understand what's going on for him. So yeah, there was many, many years where I was super sort of angry with him and hurt and mm. resentful and, and all those things. So wow. yeah, um, it's been a pretty tough road. <laughs> I can understand that someone would, would push someone else away knowing that they are on a downhill slope, you know what I mean? And, and maybe it's mm. a way of like, um, you know, not don't get too close because I know what's ultimately happening or, you know, you don't, I mean, it's so complex and totally. can, can maybe tell us a little bit, of, a little bit more about Huntington. Is it, is there a cure? Is there, how, how do you, how do you get it? Or, um, yeah, there's no cure for it. Unfortunately, they're doing um, more and more research every day. And that this, I think the stem cell reach research is something that they're looking at that could potentially um, 
help but yeah the, there's nothing at the moment uh and that's part of why it was so hard for dad to hear it because like um you know some doctors don't have the best bedside manner unfortunately um and his specialist was one of those and pretty much just said this is what you've got this is all the impact that it's going to have over your life there's no cure there's nothing you can do about it see you later kind of thing like it was really sort of a harsh diagnosis and and this is you know one of the worst possible things that you can have and we can't help you with it sort of thing mm. Um, and basically what it does, yeah, so it, it just very, very slowly takes away different functions. So some people experience sort of um, movements like tremors. So dad initially would, would always sort of look really wobbly. Like he didn't, he didn't drink um, very much at all, actually, but he would look like he was drunk. So if he'd go down to the club, for example, he'd always be questioned or, you know, around that. Um, so that's how he sort of looked. But um yeah so in in the end like you you can't you find it very difficult to swallow so the last few years of his life he was drinking only liquid um he ended up being in a wheelchair eventually because he couldn't you know he couldn't um he couldn't walk um what else uh yeah it, it is a very very complex disease and it affects every individual differently so um it was difficult for the doctors to even explain to us as it has his family, what was going on for him. Um, but yeah, he was just really frustrated, found it very difficult to communicate. And um, eventually was, he weighed like 30 kilograms is that is like a walking skeleton practically. Um, and Poor just guy. In, yeah, hmm. in like mental torture. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yes, that's really, really tough um, as on a family. But just moving forward a little bit, uh, Tamara. Um, so you were this small town girl uh, coming, you know, who became a high flying and hotshot lawyer. Ultimately, <laughs> pretty amazing. Um, you spent fifteen years, sort of, in the fast paced concrete jungles as a director at Macquarie Investment Bank in Hong Kong, uh, Canada, and Australia. Um, is there something? Uh, that you is, is is this something that you always wanted to do and, and maybe you could just tell us a bit more about that journey yeah sure um uh well i guess like many young kids growing up in school i had no idea what i wanted to do and i, I didn't sort of you know in high school i didn't really have <clears throat> a concept of of um you know, of what I wanted to do or what there was out there or, you know, um, actually I became a lawyer pretty much because my older cousin who I looked up to and she was very much a mentor of mine, she was a lawyer. So that's what I did. And I, I found school, um, quite, uh, sort of, uh, don't know, when I say quite easy, I feel like I'm blowing, <laughs> blowing my own trumpet there. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, like I, I was good at school and it just sort of seemed like the natural progression. And um, so that's what I did. And I had an opportunity to go and work for Macquarie Bank one point at one point. And yeah, I remember them sort of, I'd only been there for six months and they said, oh, do you want to, do you want to go and move over to Hong Kong? We need someone over there. We were trying to recruit someone locally for this um, crisis management role and we can't find anyone. Do you want to go do it? And I'm like, I've, I, ha I was like, I have, I've never had any experience in crisis management. Like, no, you know, we think you can do it. And yeah, it was super exciting at the time. And it just was a, I had to make a really fast decision as well. And it was around the time where I was getting married. I was married to, to Josh. And then like the month later I flew out and I did this big project in Korea. So I'm like, this, <laughs> little kind of blonde country town girl like in the <laughs> middle of this um male dominated hierarchical extremely different culture to what i'm used to and um yeah it was an amazing experience i i worked with the best people i had a really good support team around me um they were amazing they just basically helped me be successful and i grew into that role over time and yeah ended up being the head of corporate risk for Macquarie Bank in Asia, huh. um, which was, yeah, a, a pretty, a lot of responsibility, you yeah. know, for an investment bank. Yeah. Um, 
and and also the amount of uh, events that go on in Asia as well, from you know swine flu to cyclones mm. and mm-hmm. all sorts of things. So yeah. yeah, it wasn't something that I'd ever really imagined or pictured, but I just sort of yeah like followed each opportunity as it came up and uh, had the courage to step into things that I had absolutely no clue about. And um, yeah. That's amazing. That was a pretty amazing experience. <laughs> it's true testament to who you are as a person. I mean, like anyone that knows a bit about investment banking, working as the head of risk is like a ridiculous role. You know, it's, um, there's a, there's a, so much responsibility on you. So, you know, really well done, but how did you find it? Um, you know, as a woman working in a male dominated industry, like how did you manage it? Was there, did you have any difficult moments at all? What was it like for you? Yeah, it was, it, it, I found it extremely <laughs> challenging actually. And especially because I look a lot younger than my age. So I'm 42 now. And so back then, I was late twenties, early thirties. So, um, looked even younger. And so it, and it was, I, you know, looking back now, it's totally my own perception as well. I would always come into a boardroom with the perception that they're going to think that I look really young and that I'm 12 mm. and that I've got nothing to say. So I always felt like I had to prove myself in the first few sentences. Um, of meeting someone before they would take me seriously. Um, and then, you know, put sort of different Asian cultures on top of that, where it's very, you know, like Korea, for example, is very much, it's your age, like it's, yeah, it's male dominated, but it's also your age and the time that you've spent in the workplace as to, to the hierarchy. Mm. Um, and the seniority. So yeah, it was, it was super challenging and it was just a matter of just like, basically getting in there and believing in myself the whole time and and probably with a um with a lot more sort of like domination type energy mm. than than really felt comfortable and that you know wasn't really me but I felt like I had to dominate in a lot of those situations um and I guess that that's probably I think has led me on the path of um I guess losing myself a little bit in, in, in those roles and those images and what I thought I needed to be um, in terms of being professional and serious and um, you know, all those sorts of things. So yeah, it was challenging, but again, like I also had, like I said before, incredible people supporting me and I had some, there were some men that were very challenging and dominating back and, you know, some experiences that I had, but there were also some men that were absolutely phen- phenomenal and they were by my side and supporting me every step of the way. And they had my back in those negotiations and those meetings. And, um, and yeah, so I sort of experienced both. Yeah. Wow. That's good probably like, wow, this Aussie lady is hardcore. You know? <laughs> 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 Yeah. It's but, funny, like in my later years, I, like I, I, I've sort of also have a very soft side to my personality and some of my later friends are like, we can't imagine you being like, <laughs> being like that. I'm like, yeah, there's a tiger in there. Don't worry yeah, about definitely. that. Definitely. <laughs> and, and do you have any advice for girls or um, women that are in that industry now? Oh, that's a really good question. I think, I think the world is changing actually. Um, it's changed a lot since, um, since I was there. Um, oh, I think don't, don't be afraid to be yourself. Like don't feel like you necessarily have to bring something else or something, you know, to the table that you're not, because there is such, um, such power in that softness you know, you, if, mm. if you, and, and to be heart centered, I'm fi- I find it difficult to describe this in words cause I'm very kinesthetic and, uh, it's been something that I've have explored in, in sort of the last decade in terms of spirituality, but just coming back into your heart center and slowing down and doing things like meditation and breath work and things like that to keep you grounded and centered because, um, you know, as women, we are so powerful. We have so much to offer in the workplace, in the corporate world. And, um, that 
that more na the, the natural nature that we have of collab being collaborative and heart centered and things like that. That's kind of what the workplace needs, not for us to be, you know, coming in there trying yeah. to dominate and manipulate and, mm. and, and, you know, like it's sort of, it's something that's being phased out because I think it doesn't work anymore. Like I think the evolution of the world is more about collaborate collaboration and, and putting all of the truth, all of your cards on the table um, in a negotiation, you know, just be, being there and, and putting yourself in both shoes and, and just talking about everything, not having hidden agendas and not trying to manipulate the outcome. Um, I really think that sort of is the, the, the kind of thing that's going to bring peace to the world and, and also better outcomes in, in business. And I think um, like the corporate world really, it really does need to change the mindset. It might be a little bit now, but like, you know, things like being vulnerable and being able to say like, you don't know something or whatever, that's still kind of looked upon as like, okay, you're just weak or, you know, you're no good or whatever. And, and we really need to really need to bring that vulnerability into the corporate world, I think. Absolutely. Because I think energetically, if you're hiding all of that stuff and pretending like it's not there, people can tell anyway. And it mm. just, it comes out in either anger or frustration or like it, you know, it's there anyway. The elephant in the room is there. Mm, exactly. So I think if, if we get used to expressing it more, like that's how we connect. Like if we're, if we're vulnerable and share what's going for us in the moment, connection happens and then you get an outcome that's best for both people or both organizations. So yeah, I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. And, and where do you think like in those early years and now still today, like where your drive and determination comes from? <sighs> um, I think having a family who are all sort of driven in business and um, wanting to achieve and be at their best. Um, I think probably being small and, and being that sort of small little girl kind of thing, just, and a few sort of situations that I can remember where I was told that I didn't make something because of my height or, um, you know, that I needed to keep up or, or stuff like that. Just, it's like, I'll show you <laughs> and <laughs> had that drive. Um, my dad used to joke with me, you know, I'd come home really excited because I'd had, 90% on a, on a test result, for example. And he'd say jokingly, well, where was the other 10%? Like, why wasn't it a hundred kind of thing? And <laughs> like, so I can get the joke now, but at the time it was like, Oh, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> I was, I thought that was really good. And so, um, yeah, that, that sort of just drive for external validation and approval and, um, just from my environment and what, what I saw in the world. Yeah. Mm. You never know how those small things will, you know, affect, will affect you down the track and, and also the things you say to others, how they will be affected by them. It's, it's always really interesting to me that those, you know, it's probably just a little off the cuff joke, but mm. to you as a little girl, you're like, geez, yeah, I need to work harder or whatever it is, you know? Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And, it, and like my determination is one of my superpowers and it's amazing. And I, you know, I, I used to have more so like laser focus and this endurance where I could just do anything, do what it takes. But because of that sort of, I was the, the reason I was doing that is for the external validation and like basically my fight flight response is on all the time in my body because I'm just wanting to do the best and be the best I can be. Um, eventually that has basically caught up with me and my body, um, I think I mentioned to you last year was just like, we can't be in that fight flight mode, like 90% <laughs> mm. of the time. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> true. So um, true. yeah, for sure. Yeah. And before we move on from your time in, in Hong Kong and Canada and, and that kind of thing, were there other sort of any interesting or, or really great memories of your time in living in those countries? Oh, it was, yeah, just work hard, play hard. Uh, um, it was like a big kid's playground in Hong Kong, really. Um, it, yeah, you know, like just the camaraderie of being in an environment where everybody's working like a lot of hours. So you're spending, um, you know, most of your life with your work colleagues 
and you, and you have that camaraderie and, and, and then, you know, we would go out together and, and in Hong Kong, like it's safety second, there are no rules. <laughs> and so, you know, you can get into a lot of mischief and fun over there. Um, just, yeah, traveling all over the world, sort of feeling like a bit of a, a superstar with, you know, different, um, uh, like I had an APEC um, card. This is so silly. I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but I had an APEC card. <laughs> And so at the airport, wherever I used to travel, I just go straight to the front of the line, like through with the pilots and be able to just (laughs) travel (laughs) (laughs) waiting and traveling business class. And um, yeah, but just the people mainly like just some really epic people that were, were so amazing at what they did and just really good hearted people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and talking always, about, yeah. yeah, it is always the people. And talking about epic people and Hong Kong, uh, and you mentioned earlier on the last time we actually saw each other was just 11 years ago. And that was um, because I came to meet you in Hong Kong. I was working in Singapore at the time on a project and uh, a common friend of ours, uh, MC Mick Carroll, um, he was staying with you on his way back from London to Australia. And just to give a little background just from my side, like I'd met Mick probably, I don't know, 10 years before that and or not not even that, not, not that long but maybe like I don't know six years before that and we were like just almost the best of mates a lot of us were like that you know um yeah. back, back then and he was a person that just brought people together he was the most smart nice funny cool outgoing guy like in the world and um sadly like things went a little bit wrong for him and yeah, get a little bit emotional actually talking about it now. But, you know, he he sadly, um, after we all were in Hong Kong together, like a couple of months after that, he sadly took his life. Um, and it was devastating for everybody, um, really devastating. And I know that um, you and Joshi spent some time with him just before he died, like a few days or just before he um, committed suicide. And uh, you said there was some quite profound things that happened then. And maybe you also just want to sort of give your side of the story with Mick. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Oh, he was just such an incredible person, just the life of the party and so quick, we quick witted. Like he was just so hilarious. He'd have us all in stitches all the time and <laughs> just could make a joke out of nothing. Um, mm-hmm one of the smartest people I knew, like, yeah, oh, he just so much love and just looked up to him so much. Like he's a complete larrikin and sometimes mm. could be a total dick as well, <laughs> um, but just such a big heart. And like you said, um, was, was just so good at connecting communities together. Um, yeah. So we, we went and saw him. We knew he was, he was struggling. Um, in the last few months of his life and we went and saw him in Melbourne about a week or a few days before he passed away. And, um, he basically said to us when we were there that, Oh, he, I just remember him. Cause you know how he was so vibrant and, and lively and, and such a, a, a beautiful energy. And it was like, I don't know. He just had no batteries or something. He he was just like really sort of monotone. And he said to us, um, you know, I was really hoping that seeing you guys would, uh, that I would feel happy and that I would be glad to see you, but I'm not like, I just have to tell you the truth. I'm not, I'm not feeling anything. And like Josh was one of his best mates in the whole world. And we were just like, Oh my God, like he, how much pain he is in. Um, so yeah. And, um, I remember flying back to, to Hong Kong. Um, Oh, one of the other things he said as well, that uh, like he was trying, you know, he was going through various treatments and things and he was trying to get his life back on track, but he said he couldn't focus for more than like a few seconds at a time on anything. And so his superpower, like his intelligence, um, was gone and he just like, didn't know how to be in the world. Um, plus not having that feeling of connection with his Mm. mates like that, you know, that was his life, you know? Um, And yeah, anyway, so I I flew back to Hong Kong for work before Josh did. And um, I, I got the news that he'd passed away just a few days after we'd seen him. And so 
I, you know, just couldn't help but but wonder whether he was waiting for um, mm. for us to, you know, to, mm. to see him before because I think he was thinking about doing that um, for for a while. And yeah, I remember Josh getting home, pulling up to to home in the taxi. And he didn't know yet because he was on the plane when I found out. Mm. And I told him and we were in the middle of Hong Kong on the street and he um, just like let out the biggest scream like no and just like, oh, yeah, no. it was just like screaming at the top of his lungs Shame. in the middle of the street in Hong Kong. Mm. And um, yeah, it was, it was, it was awful. Yeah, it was so sad. Um, I I, <clears throat> I was talking to Craig about this um, a little bit before we started chatting, and I remember I remember that you guys said that you had been to see MC. So I and I kind of didn't have like any closure whatsoever um, because I got an email from Vaughny like at work. I remember, and he um, sent this mail saying, you know, Mick, Mick is Mick is dead, and I'm like, well, are you joking with me? Like I actually, I actually thought it was a joke. I'd walked into the office at like 8 a.m. I had my porridge, just like I always do. And I read this email and then I replied and then I messaged another guy, Johnny, a friend of ours. And he's like, no, it's true. And I just, I was like the, the manager of this team in this investment bank. And like, you know, people, I guess, probably saw me as a bit of a hard ass back then. And, and I just walked up to my boss and I flip and burst into tears. And then he was in shock. He's like, what is, what, you know, and he took me to the side and I just flip and I couldn't stop. And I said, I'm so sorry, this is what's happened. I need to go. Um, but I, but, and then I never really had like proper closure. And I remember emailing, um, you know, Joshy quite a while afterwards. And, um, and he, he sent me the, the most nice email I probably ever received in my life. He like, mm -hmm. I don't know, he must have taken an hour or two to sit down and write it and just say, you know, really nice things about Mick and your guys' last visits and nice things that he had said and that he was still thinking of us. And, you know, it was just like beautiful. So, you know, Aww. I'm so thankful that, that he wrote the email. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, super sad, eh? Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And it's something that happens fairly commonly to people. And I think you guys have both like literally experienced it firsthand to, you know, to see that, that empty shell of a person. And I mean, it must be just heartbreaking to see someone like that, but do you feel like they, you could have helped him in some way? Was there, or was there any like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I kind of felt like, I felt like a bit of regret that I didn't know that he was in such a bad state. Cause I was like, mm -hmm. I would have gone to Australia and stayed with him, but I didn't, I mean, Ooh speaking to people like you coxie like and and other people are just like no i don't think it would have even helped he had other mates that had tried to do that and stay with him but he mm. was just too gone just mm. too, yeah too and we only really didn't realize how bad it was until that time like and that was only a few mm. days before Jeez. before he passed away and we and we, like we had those discussions we're like shit like should do you want to stay like why don't you stay mm. all those sorts of things mm. but um I don't think it would have made a difference because he he yeah. made the decision and wow. there was nothing that was going to stop him. I don't think. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Thank, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Uh, I know for both of you, that's, that's not an easy thing, but I think it is an important thing to, to openly discuss and, and uh, try and understand uh, like mental illness and, um, and how tough it can really be for people that even seem, just on top of the world a lot of the time, which is for me always kind of a, a shocking thing, you know, like, but, mm. but thanks, thanks for sharing that guys. So, so Coxie, you basically beyond, you know, in your life, you'd had everything you'd wanted up until that point, more or less, and uh, had a great career, an amazing husband. Uh, and then you sort of decided to pack it all in and, and try something new. And you worked for a, a business called Arbon. And um, what made you make that decision? Um, and, um, yeah, did you feel it was like a risky decision to do? Yeah, it was super scary. Um, it did feel like a risky decision. Um, I, I guess, um, living the life that I had up to that point, I felt so fulfilled. Like I was a director and um, in Macquarie Bank, and I'd, 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 I felt like I had achieved a lot in my time. And um, 
I wanted to start a family and it took us like a few years basically to fall pregnant with Cade. And um, I, I, I guess I had the realization that I, I didn't want to become a mom and then go back into a really senior role in that way because the, you know, the expectations and the responsibilities that you have um, as a leader in, in that type of role are high and, yeah, I just, I felt like I wanted to be present as a mum and to be able to um, be at home. And there, there was that whole, like, again, it's probably just a perception thing, but my perception was that if I had a child in that sort of role, that I'd have to go back, be back at work sort of within three to six months full time and have my child in care. Hmm. Um, and I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to get back to the country out of the concrete jungle so that my <laughs> kids could breathe fresh air. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I, I need to be able to, you know, when I guess I had all of these expenses and this way of living and, um, you know, what I'd become accustomed to. So I needed to have a, a, an alternate solution. And so, yeah, that's basically what led me into network marketing. And I, I spent a few years doing that and, um, you know, made incredible income and it enabled me to be at home um, with my kids for a number of years um, without all of that, the pressure of the corporate world. So it was the best decision ever. And yeah, it sort of kicked off, like, I think such a, just a big change and like becoming a mum one, oh my God, like I just, I never knew how challenging it would be, like amazing, um, best thing I've ever done. And also so challenging. Like I, I thought before that, that I was invincible and that I could do anything. Um, but then like these little gorgeous things that you, you, you can't control them. They pretty much run the show. Um, you can't dominate them into an outcome. I'll tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, that's sort of like just cracked me wide open basically. And just, um, had me on this path to really look in, inwards and, and really find out who I really was and, and yeah, so that, that it's been amazing as well. And I just sort of, you know, started to feel like, you know, why in a, as in a society, can we not be parents and, and, and have this, you know, incredible career, but have both and not have to work like mm -hmm. so many hours a week in order to, um, to get by. And of course we don't, cause we choose everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but there were a lot of years where I, uh, I sort of spent being angry at the world and, you know, pointing and blaming and like society is like this and it's wrong. And, um, yeah, until I was like, Oh, okay uh, I get to choose and pretty much everything that I'm pointing the finger at, I'm doing myself if <laughs> I was really honest with myself. So, yeah. so yeah. And, and what, what sort of challenges and difficulties? And I mean, obviously there's lots of good things, but what are the challenges that you found with motherhood? Um, one of the things was, um, staying present with them and I, uh, and, and, my ability to focus like I mentioned before that I had this determination and I could focus on a task for hours on end and just be laser focused and get the job done basically and I don't know whether like th that feels to me like quite a, a masculine skill and obviously when you have a baby and all these hormones and everything are going on and you're required to be totally soft and nurturing and things and they talk about baby brain which is mm -hmm. a real thing <laughs> <laughs> It was like, I, I felt like I'd lost all my superpowers and the things that made me me and made me function in the world. Um, and yeah, and like, I'd, I'd really want to be present with them, particularly when number two, when Lil Maybe came along, because uh, it was, you know, a big enough shock to the system to have one child, but then to, to have two and to keep, try and keep both of them safe at the same time and provide that nurturing um, yeah, I found it really difficult and I, and I found myself, um, in my brain, just thinking about work and business and supporting the family and all those things that I'd been conditioned, like that I'd been doing for the first sort of 20 years of my life. Um, I couldn't get out of that loop and it was, yeah, it was, um, no matter how my, my intention and how much I tried to be present with them, I was failing. I was like all, always in my head and then getting frustrated with myself and 
thinking that I was a bad mother and, um, you know, all those things. So that cycle of guilt Mm. and judgment and all that sort of stuff whilst trying to take on a completely different role in life. um, Yeah. I found that super challenging. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I can only imagine, you know, Craig and I like, you know, we're both hopefully going to be dads in the next couple of years. So the more information that we can have, uh, the the better, that's for sure. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like it's been the best thing in the world because I don't think that I could have the amount of growth and transformation that I've had without them because there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. Like they're your little mirrors and they're there. (laughs) And um, yeah, and you just have this drive even more so to to be the best version of yourself for them. And you become very aware of the impact that you're having on them. And, Mm -hmm. and that is even more motivation and drive than, than what you would have if it was just doing it for yourself kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's awesome. And um, so the last year has been really tough. Like 2018 was a, you know, tremendously traumatic, uh, tragic, difficult one for you for various reasons. I mean, we'll just touch on, on the first one. Uh, you've spoken a lot about your dad and uh, sadly you lost your dad. And, um, you know, even through all the, I guess the, the hard times and that he was still such a big part of your life and someone you really admired and look up to, uh, how has that impacted you and maybe made you reflect on your life? Yeah. Um, It's been huge. Um, It's been like a whole variety of emotions, as you can imagine, after him suffering for so long. Um, A big part of me, as hard as it is to say it, was relief that he was finally at peace and not suffering. Um, and, And actually, I can feel a connection with him um so much stronger than I have for many many years now that he's gone actually like he I can feel his energy I can feel him supporting me I can feel like all those things around yearning to be able to communicate with him I can now do that like it's really weird I can't explain it but it's like he he's there and he's communicating with me all the time whereas in his physical body he couldn't do that um And yeah, like all that striving and achieving and doing things for external reasons is falling away a lot more quickly now that he's gone. I really sort of feel him and all these memories are flooding back of when he was well, when he was younger, just like this spunky, hilarious um, joke star, like just rebel, like just didn't give a fuck about rules and like just would do whatever he wanted he didn't care what other people thought just all of that is just flooding back into my body just going and him his message just going just be whoever you you know be you be the real you and and shine and don't care what other people think and um yeah so that that's been really beautiful and um I I'm so grateful that uh, having Kate and the challenges that I just spoke about becoming a mom and really getting present to the impact that I have on my kids and other people in the world, whilst that was really super confronting the last few years, I've, I've put a lot of effort into healing my relationship with my dad. I mentioned to you before that I was holding a lot of judgment and resentment. And so the last few years I've had a lot, a lot of one way conversations cause he couldn't talk, but really just expressing mm. myself with him and making peace and, and having lots of forgiveness. Um, and I'm so grateful that I was able to do that, um, before he passed away, mm. you know, because I think a lot of people hold on to, to this illusion of what they think and stories that they, and I know oh, it feels so real. It feels so real. Um, but it's just a story and a perception, like the truth bet- of, of a connection between a parent and a child, no matter what's happened mm. is just like, it's just this love that you can't describe, you know? And I was depriving myself of that feeling. I was depriving mm. myself of that for, for so many years when it was there all along. Mm. And yeah, so it, it's been, um, 
a pretty significant event in in my life <laughs> obviously mm-hmm. yeah it's really beautiful uh yeah. coxie there just to imagine that you you know just flooded with those good thoughts and feelings as well that's just really great to hear you know i think yeah it's very easy i suppose if it's such a long slow drawn out thing to just um see him, your dad in that way but you know when he when he's actually gone you you flooded with those good memories again so that's mm. yeah amazing actually but you know look, I, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry i just thought of something uh, mm. um like even like the last couple of weeks before he passed away i was there with him a lot and i remember one day i was there um you know, just sort of, he was laying down, I was holding him and I was expressing like just how much I appreciate how hard he worked for us all of his life and, um, you know, how much he loved us and, and, and just sort of like speaking words of love to him. And, um, my perception was like, he, he took a couple of swings at me and he couldn't talk and he was like really he kind of got that frustrated look on on his face and i was like whoa wow. and i got so hurt by it and i was like far out dad like i said i don't know why you did that i'm sure you're in a lot of pain but i love you anyway and you know it doesn't change the way i feel i'm not sure why you're angry and over the next you know 24 to 48 hours i drove myself insane trying to th- trying to work out what he was trying to communicate to me, you know, why is he angry with me and all of that crap that, that you, you know, spin in your head. And then, um, the day that he passed away, the morning that he passed away, I was sitting there with him and I was just, I was playing his favorite songs and I was just in this real connected space with him. And I was basically praying for him to get, the most magical angel wings like and have like an extra amount of bliss given to him for all the suffering that he had had in his life I was just like you know please just like make him so free and just so full of bliss when he goes and as I was sitting there doing that I was also then it was a really weird experience like feeling that that love that I was giving to him, I was feeling that back to me being given back to me through my heart, like a sort of like a cycle thing. And then I heard his voice just randomly out of the blue and it was his cheeky voice. Like he obviously wasn't talking, but his voice in my ears said, um, what did he say? He was like, I was trying to give you a hug, you dickhead. (laughs) That's what he said. Wow. And I was like, what? And I, I had memories flood back of when, how I thought he was trying to take a swing of me at yeah. me. And he's like, yeah, I couldn't get my arms above my head to give you a hug. Uh, and I was like, boy. oh shit. And then I was like, I started feeling guilty and I was like, oh my God, like I'd missed this magical opportunity that, that my dad was trying to hug me and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then he just said, and then his voice softened and he's like, it's okay, sweetie. Like, everything is okay like all of it all of the past like everything is forgiven and all that remains now and forever in this moment is that is love and like that exact feeling that that I was experiencing in that moment so yeah and he he passed away probably about 10 minutes after that so wow yeah sure yeah (laughs) (laughs) sad Yes. Mm. So yeah, it's just a, it's a so, lot of big fat lessons in perception and love and the the meaning that we that we put to things. Yeah, um, tell me about it. Sure. And actually, like, um, I don't know. I just feel like I'm I'm on a roll here, but I just thought of something <laughs> else. Um, the the pain that I experienced in the last year in my body. I don't know, Chick, can I move on? To yeah, that? yeah, we were, I was literally going to yeah. mention that, like, you know, so maybe you, yeah, you want to tell us about, you know, you, yeah. well, what you mentioned to me is like, or what I read, you said you had severe inflammation for like seven months and you had to like lift mm. your legs up into the car. And, and why do you think you had the inflammation? Was it a result of like stress and, and a few other things, and, you know? Yeah, well, um, 
medically I had a lot of tests done and uh, one possible answer was rheumatoid arthritis or um, some kind of autoimmune, multiple autoimmune responses going on in my body. And uh, basically my fight flight response is on too much basically. Um, and I sort of feel like actually it's a bit of my normal, like uh, because I, I just because of the, the life that I've had, and that drive, like uh, that feels normal to me to have it on. Like I can feel it on, I can feel that wearing, but it just feels like normal. That's what I do sort of thing. Um, and yeah. And, and like, I guess my belief is also that trauma and emotional trauma is stored in our body as well. And there was a point in time where it basically caught up with me, but December of last year, so about a year ago before dad passed away, I remember like in December, I was thinking about 2018 and the year ahead and what I wanted to experience and setting my intentions and stuff for the year. And it, and it was basically about like experiencing the best health that I've ever had and just like really, truly thriving in, in my body and like, and, and getting younger, feeling younger in my body, not older. So that was my first intention. And then my second intention was to experience unconditional love and, and to, to bring more of that into my life. So yeah, they were my intentions and I got the complete opposite basically <laughs> at first. I was like, holy moly. It was literally weeks after that, like about a month after that, that all of a sudden I, I had all of this inflammation come on in my body and wow. it was, yeah, it was horrendous. Sorry. The sun is coming in my window. <laughs> is that better that's good yeah perfect um yeah and it was it was really painful and um i was finding it hard to even get out of bed in the morning and and all that awful awful stuff but what it gave me was one an appreciation for for health and thriving health because i've been taking it for granted for most of my life um and so now i'm sort of i'm sort of 80 percent better and just like so grateful for, for not having that pain in my body mostly mm. anymore still a little bit there and then the second thing around unconditional love was that um I got to experience that in the last year of dad's life because I got another layer of appreciation for what he must have been going through and how fucking hard it is to be a parent and be and and be loving and be a nice person when you're in that much pain all of the time mm. and like yeah i was just so frustrated and i was trying to keep it together and you know like i um i remember one day Cade accidentally dropped my computer and all my work stuff all over the floor and i was just like no what are you doing <laughs> yeah. and i and i yelled at him and his little body just kind of went into shock because I don't do that often. And yeah, then just like the guilt to coming in going, Oh my mm. God. Like I, I felt like I couldn't control um, how I was being because of the pain. And so it just gave me a massive appreciation for what people are dealing with and, and what my dad was dealing with mm. um, day to day. And, and again, like, the fact that we perceive other people as being angry and frustrated or, you know, like we take it all on ourselves, but actually they're suffering. Like they're really suffering and what they need is like love and compassion and support. Um, so it was the greatest gift in the world having that much pain in the last year. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty full on. <laughs> yeah. Jeez really had a tough uh, time with these kind of things but it, it, like you said it's there's going to be the harder something is the bigger the lesson i suppose sometimes and uh yeah you've, you've had some big ones and, and you know just these are two massive events you know like with your dad and, and your physical body like i mean an autoimmune kind of thing is mentally must be really hard because you it's my body what why is it you know why is this happening to itself like it's quite a mental thing isn't it but Mm. You know, I guess it had a, a sort of impact on, and, and this is when you really decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to move on as a lawyer and, and change things up completely. Is that, is that sort of the sequence of how things went down? Yeah, I guess um, the, having the, the stress response go on in my body and all of that inflammation, um, 
yeah, I, I needed to make some big changes with my environment. And I guess that, that drive that I was having to internally to do the best job that I could and being a family lawyer, as you can imagine, um, is quite stressful, particularly, um, the, the children's matters. Um, I did a, a few like child protection cases and things like that. And I, yeah, mm. I, I'm a big softy basically. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I do probably take on, um, my work more than what I should in that kind of role. Um, so yeah, I just really wanted to have the space to be able to heal my body and, and get out and, and relearn how to not be in that stress response all the time. Um, so yeah, big changes came to the beach, get out in the waves and the ocean grounding, mm. you know, um, mother nature, all that good stuff. So, so yeah. yeah, isn't it amazing? Like how much pressure we put on ourselves in life because we, we want to achieve and we want to do things and it's actually, you know, a lot of the time it's just sort of compounding and putting layers on us that, uh, that are, at some point they're going to go, you know what, I don't want you to do this to me anymore. So yeah. how, how have you find, found moving to the beach and being a bit more in outdoors and nature? Like has it had a huge impact on you? Yeah, huge. Yeah. I absolutely love it. Like the hardest thing is that I have a lot of family in Albury where I'm from. So I obviously miss them to pieces. Um, but I just, I just needed it, you know, like, um, the winter time in Albury, um, last year having joint inflammation was, was really challenging. And, um, just to be in that warmer climate and I'm getting up at four o'clock in the morning, going to the beach, doing meditation and walking and swimming and yeah, like I've, I've actually tried to go from being a night owl to a morning person for decades. I've been trying to do it for so long without success. And for some reason here up on the sunny coast, <laughs> it's so much easier. I don't know. Nice. Like everybody's up earlier and yeah, it's, it's made a huge difference. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. So you've actually managed to switch your, your body clock to become more of a morning person. Yep. Fascinating. Cause, cause I've just finished this book called why we sleep by this guy called Matthew Walker. Fascinating book, by the way, if you haven't read it. And, um, he actually talks about like how certain people are actually morning people and some are evening people, you know, and you almost shouldn't, that's almost kind of like there to stay. Uh, so mm. it's, it's interesting how you've managed to switch that over. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think like that's true to some extent because it's taken me decades to be able to kick that. But I, I really feel it's a habitual thing. Like it's just a, a massive habit that we get ourselves into. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's interesting that you say that though, because I I've always been like and Craig as well, we've always been morning people and I'm always like, Who's ever's not a morning person is flipping lazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like, like, like you just flip and love your bed too much. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I do, I do love yeah. it. <laughs> but when I read this book, it was fascinating because it, it actually really made me change my thoughts on it. And he's like, This is actually it made me change my thoughts and, and especially like in the business place in the workplace he's like you often have people that, that'll come in and they won't like operate until it's like 10 in the morning but they have to be there at eight and they're normally grumpy from eight to ten because they're half asleep you know and you, and you would have known lots of people like this already and it probably what maybe it was you but um it really made me actually shift my thinking and and just really and you know try and understand people that little bit deeper as well to go okay cool i realize you're not a morning person um that's just that's just part of your genetics and your makeup so um it is interesting just at least knowing that i think especially if you manage people um and you're a leader in business you know that you're going to have some people that are just not going to operate in the mornings and that's cool and then maybe you do th cool things like you switch the times that they come in, you know, so they can stay later because that's when they actually yeah. operate better. Yeah. 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 It's yeah interesting. That's cool. But I also think uh, like, like anything in our genetics and in our makeup, it, there's always a nature versus nurture kind of a thing. So when you, when you mention habits, you know, what, what, how, what percentage of that is habit? What percentage is, is your makeup? And, and you can ask that, I guess, about anything about us. Um, 
and I, and I think that, uh, yeah, it's just an interesting kind of a concept to think of, but it's cool that you, when you're at the beach, there's something about, obviously in Queensland with no daylight saving, the sun's up early in the summer and uh, yeah, it's just, it's, I'm the same. Like I just want to be up, you know, like everyone's up and about and it just feels good, isn't it? To, to yeah. get that warmth so early in the morning. It's, it's beautiful actually. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to move on to your, your new business, um, Thrive Leadership. Uh, where you share an alternative way to the grind of the nine to five. Uh, maybe you can tell us more about that business, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, so basically uh, being up on the Sunshine Coast um, and deciding, you know, to spend some time away from from being a lawyer, sometimes in these smaller pockets of Australia, there's less kind of employment opportunities, right? So, um, I sort of have started looking for, okay, well, what, what am I going to do? Um, and I've tried like a number of different businesses before, so network marketing and different online things and online is where it's at, right? Like, even though, uh, um, a bit of a dinosaur compared to my little Gen Y friends who are amazing, <laughs> um, there's massive opportunity online at the moment. There's so, there's so much out there. And so I ended up finding this platform actually through, um, through my health, really like searching for different, um, for, for, for different sort of technologies and things to help with my inflammation. I just ended up coming across this with, um, through a friend and basically the idea is like, it's the community behind it actually just always goes back to the people, but this community of people that, um, are really conscious and wanting to make an impact in the world. And they're the kind of people that take radical responsibility for themselves, um, and there's this amazing educational platform that basically teaches people how to leverage social media and exactly what's working right now. Right. Cause the algorithms are changing, you know, daily mm -hmm. and they've, you know, uh, connected with, um, these amazing people that are, are, are up with all of that stuff and yeah, teaching pe people to basically build that brand online and have an impact in the world in whatever their particular genius happens to be. So yeah, it just feels really good. I went to a, a freedom festival a few weeks ago and, and met a lot of my online friends in person. <laughs> <face to> face. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was amazing. Like you can actually develop really strong connections online. Like it's just such an amazing way of connecting with people that are really aligned and have the same values. Um, yeah. And it was a phenomenal event. We had sound healers and all sorts of amazing stuff as well as business. Um, we had Kerwin Ray who's mm. made like $12 million last year on Facebook and like all this amazing um, business content. But at the same time, this whole focus on, on doing the inner work and taking responsibility for your own shit and, and the energy that you put out into the world um, and giving yourself the space and the time to heal that. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's a lot of sort of businesses out there that talk about time freedom and, um, you know, financial freedom and, and that's great. And that, that's what this provides, but more importantly, on top of that, it's the inner freedom. And, and that really comes from, you know, taking a look at your life and being super honest with yourself about the impact that you're having on the world and just giving you, yourself that time and space to, to really do the things that you love. And, and because I think if we just take a whole lot more care of ourselves and nurture ourselves in, in the way that feels good, then, and fill our own cup, then the genius comes out and, you know, then you're able to, to shine the brightest light that you, that you can sort of thing. So, yeah, so it's an affiliate marketing business and it's really all about um, bringing together um, a collective group of conscious humans that are, are, are doing amazing things in the world and, and supporting each other and collaborating and, and doing it together. So, yeah. Awesome. So, so I'm just sorry, is it like a type of, I mean, I know you said it's an affiliate, affiliate marketing thing, but is it also a type of coaching? What, how does the, what's the kind of nitty gritty? Yeah. So basically um, there's an educational side of things that has the education about exactly what's working now and building a brand on social media. So that's the main part about it. And then there are different products that you can partner with. Basically that's the affiliate marketing side of things that you can earn a, uh, earn a commission on. 
um, we partner with some sort of high ticket, high commission items. And then there's like the, the mentorship program inside of that as well. So the, the collective community group of incredible leaders that, that have, you know, coaching skills and healing skills and all, you know, people from all different backgrounds, basically just in their genius and sharing that into the community. So, yeah. And just, just my like, uh, like knowing of you and, you know, uh, is, is coaching like something you would be interested in doing yourself? Cause it, you come across as a person that has done so many cool things and like got so much experience in life and business. And, uh, you know, that, that's often where like a lot of good coaches are born. Is that something that you would ever sort of think about doing yourself? Yeah, I've definitely considered that. Um, and I'm also a, um, an accredited mediator as well. So I could take on that role in terms of workplace or community disputes and things like that to really help bring people together. So yeah, it's definitely something I've thought about. Um, my focus at the moment is really healing um, my body and just um, getting it back to tip top shape to bring my energy up to the to the maximum amount so that I can give more um, because I, I really feel like when people are giving from a space of just give 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 without actually taking care of themselves then it's not really serving anybody so yeah, yeah that's my focus um, at the moment is is healing and and yeah absolutely I think I think just even sharing my story and sharing what I've been through, not necessarily from a, this is what I think you should do, but just sharing my experience and the detail of how I have looked at certain situations in my life and, and taken responsibility for it and released, you know, emotional trauma out of my body, even just sharing from, from that place, I think um, is useful. For sure. And the sharing is, is like we Gareth and I always talk about this is just like, you know, just even this, this podcast, you know, it, it's so meaningful to so many other people because it just allows you, it gives you the um, permission to feel those things and, and know that it's okay to, and you should, you know, work through those things, those tough things in your life to sort of come out the other side, more fulfilled from the inside out, not the outside in. So you know, yeah. it's really awesome that, that, that you're okay with doing that because a lot of people just keep it inside, you know? Well, I haven't always been okay with it. And I think that, um, yeah, for a long time I have hidden the fact that, well, I'm this professional person, I'm this lawyer, like I'm supposed to have my shit together and I can't share it. Like you just don't do that. You just get on with it and you hold it all in. And that's what I've done for many years. And I've fought a bit of a slow learn. I finally realized that it's, <laughs> that's not good for me and it's not good for anyone. You know, if, if someone who appears to have all this success in life and appears to have their shit together, doesn't have their shit together, then that gives permission for other people to go, actually, it's okay. Like you don't, I, I'm not broken. I don't need fixing. I'm mm. just a human being like everybody else. And, and yeah, I can be, um, strong and powerful and make impact. And at the same time, I can be dealing with some tough issues and, and be not okay some of the time. Um, and I think, you know, having a friend who, who, who took his own life in, in Mick and, and having my dad who also tried to take his own life and, you know, like there are people suffering and mm. it, it's, I think it's important for us to, to start sharing more. For sure. And uh, I've watched a lot of your videos um, and I really love what you're sharing. And I think it's so great, you know, like literally just, just tell people what you're going through, because like you said, it's that permission, you know, you, you're not necessarily showing that you've got weaknesses or whatever you want to say, like, but you are just saying, it's okay. I'm just human. And you can also, you know, you're also human too. So uh, just let the guard down and, and tell people the truth. Cause I think that's important. And it's interesting that you said like, you know, that you are somebody who's always had it together and that's how I've always like seen you, but, but not as in like you have it together and you're this hard toughie. I'm like, gee, she's so happy and everything's great. And you know, life just seems awesome. And it's really interesting to see that other side and um, to therefore always be considerate um, about other people and you never know what they're going through 
it's so important to to always keep that in in mind when you're speaking to people isn't it absolutely a hundred percent yeah it's so so easy for us to judge and judging is a habit as well you know it's it's just it's something we even do to connect with each other you know yeah. like judge other people just to feel yeah yeah and um it's just it hurts yourself and it hurts other people and that's and that that's something that i do whenever i notice myself gossiping or judging someone else um as soon as i notice it um, I flip the mirror on myself. I'm like, mm. one, you know, like if I had the same upbringing as that person, is it possible that I could be doing that behavior that I'm judging? Mm. Yes, of course it is. And two, like from a quantum physics neuroscience level, like everything is a mirror. Like where am I, where in my life am I doing that exact same behavior right mm. now to someone else? And I haven't found a situation yet once where I haven't been able to catch myself out. So um, yeah, we're all different, but we're all the same. Like, you yeah. know, just compassion is so key and yeah, it's, um, and that self-awareness that you just said now, nah, like I don't, yeah. I think that is actually a big one, which people struggle with, you know, they, they aren't able to mm. switch the mirror on themselves and that's where the yeah. downfall is for, I think for a lot of things. Um, they're not able yeah. to go, Oh, actually I'm, I'm being like this cause I've got an insecurity. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. 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 And there's lots of great support people out there that can help you with that. Mm. Like I know, I know for me, I've worked with some incredible people and one in particular who, um, a guy who really helped me see the impact that I was having cause I couldn't see it. And it was, it was the impact on my kids that really started getting me to become aware of what I was doing. And like, even just the tiny little lies that you tell each day and the manipulation and the domination and, you know, um, to, to win an argument or, you know, to get the outcome that you want. And they're all natural behaviors, you know, like the survival mechanisms that we learn as kids, but the power and the inner freedom and the peace that you get, if you can be aware and be really honest with yourself is indescribable. Like that's where you really start to get to take your power back and, and start to be able to operate more from your heart space. And yeah, it's, it's takes courage, but it's so worth it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And maybe you can give us a little bit of advice for people that are actually going from corporate to, to an entrepreneurial sort of a life. Is there, are there like some rules for this or is it basically just, you know, feel it out for your own journey? Yeah. Um, I think uh, doing the inner work is key. And for a lot of years, I didn't understand even what that meant. Like, what do you mean? Cause it, cause you know, when, when you're used to, achieving and doing something for a certain outcome or for a person or achieving a goal or, you know, getting a deal or whatever it is that you're doing in your corporate life. Like that awareness of what's going on inside of you is, I, I found that really tricky to begin with. So my advice would be to get some support around you, like go and find some programs, start to learn start to do some experiential learning and, 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 and tap into that awareness of where you're dominating or, or manipulating or lying or re yeah, that, that, that awareness of self, I think is key from making the switch because it also allows you then to go, okay, well, because a lot of people that are working in the corporate life and they want to be more entrepreneurial or, or change their circumstances in life, for me, I speak for myself personally, there was this image that like you kind of have to let go of, like of, of being professional, but, but I'm this and I studied for that many years to, to be this, like, and you've got to allow yourself to make mistakes and fail and fail. Oh my God, I said that word. <laughs> and um, yeah, like, I think getting support around you and, mm. and letting yourself or being aware of the fact that a lot of that stuff is going to crumble away, but it's, it's for like, it's the best thing ever. Cause you get more connected to who you really are without all of the layers and all of that crap that yeah. we cover ourselves totally. with for our lifetime. 
Yeah. It's so important to hey? like to just understand who you are seriously. And like people look at it like this esoteric fluffy sort of stuff, but actually we all need to do that work. It's like really, really important, especially if we do want to move forward and we want to thrive and be better people yeah. and be a better, like be better as a collective as well. And you just Absolutely. got to drop that ego and go, okay, cool. I'm going to do the thing is like, meditation and yoga and you know whatever breathing and and all these other things like that are that are involved in in that sort of sphere um so important to get to know who you are yeah yeah and Absolutely. so coxie we've had a great time with you um we know <laughs> we've we've covered so much and um you <laughs> you kindly have been sitting in your car since <laughs> before 5 a.m this morning definitely the first person <laughs> sitting in a car doing the podcast uh, but it, that crazy sound booth <laughs> he's, excited. <laughs> he's excited and he's probably going to do this in our suggestions going forward for yeah for other guests. like yeah i know it's a weird one but like a yeah, 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 can you please go and sit in your car yeah, if you can sit in your car that'll be that'll be first prize um <laughs> But uh, j just in so just in terms of you and and moving forward, what what sort of things have you got going on? And um, yeah, what can you let us know? Uh, what sort of things I've got going on? Yeah, I, I'm really just focusing on um, my health this year and like just feeling amazing in my body. So really just looking at all those things that allow a person to thrive physically, but also emotionally and mentally as well. And that is to do with, you know, that inner work. So I do that every day. I do something every day um, that connects me into myself and, and helps me sort of, um, I guess, increase that, that power of focus and just connect into my heart and the impact that I want to have in the world. And um, then I guess next is my family, my husband and my kids. I think one thing that I have learned is that previously in the past, I've always been wanting to sort of change the world and do all these things to, you know, like political systems and institutions and corporations and all that kind of stuff. When really the most important thing is um, looking at the impact that I'm having on my kids and my family and being a role model to them first. Um, and so that's been a massive lesson for me. So my focus is on, presence with them and just that's a work in progress for me definitely every day um and then yeah just basically creating a life that i'm madly in love with so i'm living in paradise in this amazing environment and just now sort of connecting the dots and putting all the things that around me that that i love and make me feel good um, and then just seeing where that takes me from there. I've got like a, a vision for ways in which I want to impact the world. Um, and, and that sort of first comes from looking internally. So, yeah. <laughs> we love, we, we totally resonate with, with all of those things, such, such great values, such great ideas. And, and yeah, I'm definitely, we both are definitely a big fan of inside out. I think that's, it's just the only way forward, you know, you have to start, there and then and then work your way out in these concentric circles um and, and sort of affect people in this ripple from there you know um so where, where can people actually find more about you and contact you if they need to or, or want to find more information about what you're doing yeah sure so on facebook i have a public profile and it's damara x writer and the <laughs> x <laughs> is because my maiden name my nickname is coxie <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm Cox Rider, so probably shouldn't hyphenate my <laughs> kid's name. <laughs> oh, classic. Uh, classic. I've also, yeah, I've also got a website called um, thriveleadership.global and I'm on Instagram as well under Damara X Rider. So yeah, you can find me there. Beautiful. Reach out, connect with me if there's anything that you want to talk to me about or connect with me on. I'm more than happy to connect with you because yeah, it's all about connection and community and mm. I'd love to hear from any of you. Yeah. Certainly. Awesome stuff. So we put together a whole lot of show notes and stuff. So we'll put all your contact details and a whole lot of other stuff in there too. So just to finish it off with our last question uh, that we like to ask uh, all of our guests, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just uh, allowing yourself to be fully expressed, 
to be fully expressed. Just let, you know, no matter whether you think that it's good or bad or ugly or otherwise or whatever, just fully express yourself. Like I have, yeah, I have this kind of professional aspect of myself where I love making a difference in the world, but I'm also like a complete goofball and I love to sing and dance and I'm going to be singing more on Facebook. P.S. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. Cause my voice isn't amazing, but I'm going to do it anyway. And yeah, just to let that little kid out. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> love, I love it. <laughs> Playfulness. It's good stuff. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to, Firstly, just say thank you so much for coming on. I think uh, this is probably the most mature conversation we've, we've ever <laughs> had in our life. But uh, this is one thing I really love about the podcast is that it, it gives us this platform that we can speak to friends, um, especially friends, actually, and just get to know more about them. And it's something that, I, you know, we talk about this a lot, Craig and I, like we don't, we think people don't actually sit down with their friends enough and, mm. and have these sort yeah. of discussions. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, yeah. the stuff, but it's, but you don't actually go that layer deeper to yeah. tell, you know, like, tell me a bit more about your childhood. And like, I know you're, I'm just using this as an example, like for some of my mates, I'm like, oh yeah, I know your dad, like growing up and stuff, but what was he actually like, you know? And these are, mm important mm. conversations to have with our friends, even with our mom and our dad and stuff. And I think uh, that's why I love this, this, uh, the podcast, because it gives us an opportunity to actually do that intentionally as, um, with other people and with, uh, with mates as well. So that's really, really cool. But, but firstly, uh, but sorry, secondly, it's just been awesome to hear your story. Um, you're such an amazing lady and I've always just looked up to you so much. Uh, you, have a big place in my heart and I uh, can, I mean, I just remember only ever fun, cool times um, with uh, yourself and the whole group and, and Joshy and, um, you know, also I'm very, very proud to say that you're a friend of mine, like you've achieved so much and you've also taken so many risks as well, you know, and you've, you've just gone with the flow and that's so cool. And then that just like, that gives other people the permission that they need to do it as well, because I feel so many people are stuck in this world and they're not happy, um, but they feel they have to carry on doing what they're doing. And it's people like mm. yourself who, who break that mold that uh, give other people the permission to go and do it. And, um, you know, I really, I just think that you have such a cool story and way of telling your story and way about you and energy that uh, people will definitely gravitate towards. So I really encourage uh, all of our listeners to to get in touch with you and and to yeah just to follow you and and listen to your wise words so um thanks very much for for the chat today thanks may you're amazing i'm just letting my myself receive all of that love and um yeah i feel really similar about you like even though we haven't spent a whole lot of time together you're just someone who lights up my face as soon as i hear your name <laughs> and i think what you're doing with this podcast is absolutely amazing i'm so proud to be on here and proud of what you're doing it's amazing so yeah and so it's so awesome to meet you too craig and i can't believe you're on the gold coast like yeah i could have like we, you could have come in the car and oh yeah we're gonna set next <laughs> <you're> amazing <laughs> next <time. laughs> I know. well you won't believe it but we haven't actually been up to noosa yet so um, oh cool definitely, definitely gonna come and visit and say hi at some stage we'd love to to pop up there um it's not that far at all. So it's, it's worth a trip up. So and awesome. now, that we've met now um, just, just briefly from my side, um, just an amazing chat. You, you, like Gareth said, you know, you, you did what it, what it took for you in your life, you know? And, and I think that's such an amazing thing, like grabbing life by the horns and like, I'm going to make this change and it's not necessarily easy, but I know this is what my family, my body, my mind needs. And, uh, just actually doing that, just, I mean, beyond all the ama other amazing things you've done, it's just, it's just such an amazing, um, uh, just an inspirational thing, really. And, yeah, I mean, just today's chat was, you know, you were so honest. Uh, it's not often that I shed a tear, but, I mean, I think it might be the first time on our podcast, but just um, your honesty uh, really touched me. And uh, so thank you for that. And, uh, I appreciate your time here today and sharing so honestly, and it's left me with a lot of um, 
deep questions within myself as well, which, which is what it's all about is to, to feed off mates. And that connection is you, you're back and you look at yourself again. You say like, what can I, you know, stimulate in my life to, to just make it that little bit better and, and contribute to others just a little bit more. So um, that's what these, these things are all about. So thanks once again from my side as well. Thank you. You guys have just made it so easy for me to be vulnerable and, and share the things that, that aren't so comfortable to share. So I really appreciate that. And yeah, I just, I feel like I'm in a really good space with life at the moment because I've got this business which, which basically helps and supports people to, to go on that path that I've been on and, and really, you know, um, change your lifestyle and, and be the full expression of who you are. So I, yeah, I really just want to support people to do that. And I really appreciate you guys having me on. Cool. Thanks, cool. Thank you. Man, brilliant chat. <laughs> awesome. yeah, great stuff. So, great how, did you, how did you find it? Awesome. Yeah, it was good. I was, yeah. yeah, I was like a little bit nervous to start with. <laughs> but, um, like I said, you guys just made me, made it really easy and super comfortable and yeah did a great job by the way you did an amazing job yeah yeah you did an amazing job sorry you probably were a bit tired at the end there <laughs> um being in your no. car, car seat for like a couple hours so i really appreciate that um and, no, and uh, even fine. just just for thinking of us and um being considerate going to the car you know that means so much uh, yeah, yeah, thank so you. the kids <laughs> don't interrupt you halfway through your chat no not hopefully within the next year like we want to make a trip yeah. out there come on week. buddy yes, yes. So, i'm still waiting for craig uh, to invite me and he's, can you believe it he hasn't whatever even, man i've invited you there okay, there we go. that's cool i'll come, I'll come see you i might not see craig. that's cool if, <laughs> if you come if you go and visit coxie then just come and say hi buddy all right uh, we can have a coffee but <laughs> okay cool man we'll catch up for a coffee. Your brother's, your brother's <laughs> coffee shop <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh classic cool, cool stuff all right yeah. cool please send my love to joshy and uh and i will and, yeah, we'll great have to do a zoom call one day to uh, yeah. just catch up personally yeah. that would be Awesome. That would be cool. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Awesome stuff. Cool. All right. So we'll have a All great right. day. Thanks so yourself. much. And have a good one. Okay. See you later. See you later. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. 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 Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy 